Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. And thanks so much for joining us on another Grand Rounds. And uh, so this is a round held at uh, the uh, University of Ottawa Heart Institute, but really for the entire region of uh, University of Ottawa community, uh, as well as uh, uh, thank you for joining us from other centers uh, around Canada. And uh, so before we get to our distinguished uh, speaker today, I'd like to just uh, review some of the logistics. And uh, so uh, uh, keep in mind that uh, you can pose your questions as the lecture uh, is in progress using the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. And uh, we will be able to answer them in turn uh, following the uh, presentation. And, uh, but we can also accept uh, live questions from you. So uh, please uh, use the hand up feature at the end of the presentation and we will be able to unmute you and bring you into the conversation and you can pose your question uh, directly uh, to the speaker. And, uh, but on the other hand, if you have any technical issues, uh, please uh, let us know through the chat feature, which is also on the bottom of your screen. And uh, if that's the case, then uh, our team, uh, Kelsey and Allison, will be able to uh, uh, work with you to make sure that you can actually join us uh, successfully. And uh, so we are absolutely delighted today for uh, really, I think, a special treat on a very, very important uh, topic. And as we uh, slowly emerge from one of human history's uh, worst pandemics of uh, unprecedented uh, proportions with disruptions uh, to our lives, and also we witness uh, its impact on our uh, uh, clinical delivery of health as well. And COVID-19 already killed more than 5 million people worldwide and uh, changed uh, how we uh, look after our patients, but also magnify the inequities uh, in healthcare and really drives a very wide wedge between uh, those in society, the haves and the, the have nots. And uh, we witness uh, this uh, every day uh, in the uh, front lines looking after our patients. And the pandemic also shed a light on the very, very important uh, contributions of public health and uh, really also bring forward how important science uh, based the decision making is the only way forward to save lives and to get us out of this pandemic. The uh, speed of the spread of the SARS-CoV-2 virus is a testament of how closely we are all connected globally. And also the recent uh, G20, COP26 uh, meetings with the global leaders uh, really underscored the inequities uh, in health, uh, for example, in vaccine distribution and reminding us that we're not safe until everyone is safe. To shed light on these very important issues and help us to connect the dots, we're particularly thrilled that uh, today we have one of the uh, world experts to help us to understand this, and that's Professor Ronald Labonte. Professor Labonte is a former Canada Research Chair and current Distinguished Chair uh, in Globalization and Health Equity and professor at the School of Public Health and Epidemiology here at the University of Ottawa. I have uh, personally learned of his distinguished career at the All Chairs Committee at the University of Ottawa when I had a chance to present his impressive dossier to the entire committee and uh, obviously garnered unanimous endorsement of the bestowment of his distinguished chair. Professor Labonte has uh, devoted his passion in public health uh, by serving important roles in governments, international uh, consultancies, and universities. For the past 25 years, his research focused on health equity impacts and uh, in the part, uh, as part of the globalization process. He chaired the Globalization Knowledge Network for the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health and the findings of which forms part of his uh, recent book entitled Health Equity in a Globalization Era and uh, published by Oxford University Press. And this book was just awarded the Medical Book of the Year Prize by the British Medical Association this year in 2021. So congratulations. He's also editor-in-chief of the BMC journal Globalization and Health and a frequent contributor to the flagship contribution uh, Global Health Watch and the co-editor of his forthcoming sixth edition. His most recent work focused on the global governance of infectious disease 
and antimicrobial resistance, very topical at this time. The political economy of tobacco farming in low and middle income countries, very relevant for cardiovascular health. And his work that, um, uh, on uh, consulting widely for UN agencies, including the WHO, UNICEF, PAHO. And for this and the other works, uh, he's been recognized with the honorary life membership of the Canadian Public Health Association, the RD de Vries Prize, and also honorary fellowship of Royal College of Physicians of the United Kingdom, amongst many others. So we are absolutely delighted today and look forward to the lecture from Professor Robert Labonte, entitled Ronald Labonte, apologies. Uh, Globalization and health equity uh, in the shadow of a pandemic. Thanks so much, uh, Professor Labonte. Okay, well, thank you very much, um, uh, Peter. And I'm now going to uh, share my screen and start uh, my uh, start my lecture. Thank you. Yeah, it looks good. Whoop. Yeah. It goes too fast, all of these things. <laughs> so, okay, so thanks very much uh, for the invitation. Um, and it's uh, an early good morning to all of you who are listening in. Um, I want to begin my lecture uh, with a land acknowledgement that uh, we respect the uh, pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. Uh, we acknowledge their long relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. And there's a certain poignancy for me with this acknowledgement uh, because I was able to share it during the virtual British Medical Association award ceremony for my book, which happened to take place on the first National Truth and Reconciliation Day in Canada. So my talk will draw from this book, but I'm going to update it now to the COVID-19 era. And the book really brought together some of the scholarly work and research findings of over 25 years, as Peter pointed out, of, of, of me and a number of others trying to examine how recent decades of globalization have structured pathways from the global level through to the national and local levels, influencing health for better or for worse. Uh, I acknowledge that it touches on topics that are possibly a bit remote for many people in public health, and I imagine also for those working primarily in clinical medicine, which is why we were actually a bit surprised when the book was singled out by the British Medical Association. But I think this was because the issues it grappled with are ultimately of importance to all of us. I'm gonna focus primarily on the content of our book's final chapter which drew attention to what we described as globalization's three great interrelated existential health crises. Now existential, because they speak to the very survival of all of us. Uh, these were a concern long before we were drawn into the shadow of the world's worst pandemic in a century. And it's now almost cliche to acknowledge that COVID-19 has highlighted the extent to which long-standing socioeconomic inequalities within and between nations have driven inequities in health risks and outcomes. Despite consensus that global inequalities are rising, there is still the good news story that poverty is declining, poverty being the world's greatest determinant of ill health. And we have seen substantial declines in both the proportion and number of people living in extreme poverty Although in absolute numbers, there are still more extremely poor people in sub-Saharan Africa now than there were in 1981. But look at how others in the World Bank now define absolute poverty based on their cutoff of country groups organized by average per capita income. So we have the extreme poverty rate of $1.90, but you slip up a little bit and it's 320 you go a bit higher and it's $5.50. And if you look at the high income countries, it's $21.70. Now that works out for high income countries like Canada say, that's roughly $13,800 a year. And I wonder how many of us could live well or healthily on $13,800 a year. So even the World Bank acknowledges that, that all of these poverty lines are really inadequate measures of what it actually means to be non-poor. 
Now, the Millennium Development Goals committed the world to cutting by half the proportion of the world living in extreme poverty by 2015, and we achieved that almost entirely thanks to poverty reduction in China. We now have this more ambitious sustainable development goal to eliminate extreme poverty by 2030. We're so far off track on this that the target has since been adjusted downwards to merely reducing it by 7%. And even if we meet this reduced target, some 600 million people will wake up January 1st, 2030, still in extreme poverty. COVID is expected to add at least 150 million more to that total. Now, even if this is achieved, is the goal ambitious enough? Uh, not according to the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, which assumed that living to an average age of 72 or so is ethically reasonable, but requires consumption closer to the $5 a day level. And that has since been revised to the $7.40 a day level. And if we use these more reasonable poverty cutoffs, by 2030, we're still gonna see well over half of the human population living in poverty. Now, income is only one part of wealth. Other components being real estate, the stocks, uh, owning original Picassos or Van Goghs, and of course, recreational goodies such as the one pictured on this slide. Some of you may be familiar with Oxfam's ongoing campaign drawing attention to the gross skewing of global wealth. In 2014, it calculated that 85 billionaires owned as much wealth as the world's poorest half of all humanity but it turns out that billionaires are a testy lot, and they don't like it when their wealth is actually underestimated. So Forbes recalculated the 2014 data and found it was only 67 people. In January 2016, uh, Oxfam recrunched the numbers and found it was only 62 people. And as if things couldn't get any worse, in 2018, it's only 42 people. And most of that wealth is stashed away in offshore tax havens. Cue here, the Panama, the Paradise, and now the Pandora Papers. While most of the world's people have seen their income shrink during the pandemic, the pre-pandemic era of financial market liberalization and the failure to curb its greed post the great financial crisis of 2008 has created yet another massive bubble in our stock market world of speculation and derivatives. And that's a game only the 1% can play and really only the 0.01%. Now billionaires globally have seen their net wealth more than double from $5 trillion to over $13 trillion since the dawn of the pandemic. And the biggest winners, perhaps unsurprisingly, have been the tech and online shopping multinationals. So there is some relief for those of us concerned about the equity aspects of public health and seeing that this goal finally made it into the SDG list. A lot of the uh, uh, wealthier countries were not really that favorable to having goal 10 on reducing inequality within and among countries. Now the goal, however, largely assumes that economic growth is the way to proceed. Since one of its targets is simply to raise the incomes of the bottom 40%, disproportionately more than the rest. But even conventional economics tells us that without simultaneously reducing the incomes of the top 60% and especially the top 1%, this will be impossible to achieve it also bumps up against a fundamental ecological contradiction. And that is the contradiction between ongoing economic growth and ecological sustainability. And, and that brings me to the second great existential crisis that we're facing, impending ecosystem collapse of which climate change is simply the most immediate. So we're already critically overshooting our ecosystem limits in some of our most critical domains. Some of you may recognize this figure. It's from Kate Rawer's influential text on donut economics, 
which indicates the social undershoots and the environmental overshoots to which economic policy really must now become subservient. And although we haven't yet passed a tipping point with climate change, we're rapidly approaching it. Unless all fossil fuels in the ground stay there and there's an immediate end to new exploration, development, and the amazing $5.2 trillion annually in public subsidies to the fossil fuel industry, we'll reach 2050 well above the 1.5 degree increase. And indeed, we may reach the 1.5 degree increase as early as 2024. Now, perhaps a bit closer to the interests of, of those of you who are working in, in cardiovascular health, one of the direct health impacts of fossil fuels is pollution mortality. Now, big oil first acknowledged their role in creating climate change over 40 years ago, but kept that information secret and instead mounted an aggressive and ongoing campaign to limit any environmental or climate change policies. And despite the 2015 Paris Accord requiring a 45% reduction in emissions by 2030, uh, since kind of upped a little bit by most country uh, pledges to, to uh, 50%, the, the forecast is that the top 50 oil companies are still on track to increase emissions by 35% over the next decade. And we know very well who created and still creates the problem, the wealthier global north, and who bears its negative health consequences. So two rather revealing maps. The top one shows the biggest sources of carbon dioxide and consequently climate change. And the bottom shows the aggregate mortality rates for four climate change related causes. No real surprise, the resource consumption of the bloated North is hundreds of times greater than the consequence bearing global South. The pandemic tie-in is that we quickly learned that air pollution makes vulnerability to COVID much worse. It was also compelling to witness how the lockdowns imposed by most countries by shutting down industry and transport made air pollution much less. But that reduction was only marginal in aggregate terms and only for a short while, with greenhouse gas emissions set to return to their normal levels well before the end of this year. So we had a glimpse of what clear skies could look like, but only a glimpse. Uh, as Peter mentioned, the world's governments are now meeting in Glasgow in what many describe as our last chance to prevent apocalyptic temperature increases. A little bit of good news. Since the Kyoto Protocol on Climate Change was agreed upon in 1996, there has been some slow decline in emissions in some of the world's wealthier countries, especially following the COP21, Conference of the Parties 21 meeting in Paris that issued the Paris Accord. Many of the world's countries have recently pledged to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2050. But to achieve that, means cutting in half by 2030 the 2005 emission levels that countries like the US have been generating. The Biden administration was getting close to this, but the Republican Party, and it appears a single Democratic senator with fossil fuel ties, uh, might be likely to dampen that hope. And globally, countries' current policies and pledges while showing some progress, are simply inefficient. So stated bluntly, our collective actions on this crisis have not taken us very far. And despite the pledges, there is still too little evidence that fossil fuels have really been ditched. So China, for example, uh, originally oriented its pandemic response to building a bunch of new coal plants. Now it changed its mind during a UN General Assembly in September 2020, where it promised to reach peak emissions soon and achieve zero emission by 2060, which is too little too late. But it's since changed its mind once more uh, because of energy outages and is again keen on coal plants. Now India's pandemic recovery, meanwhile, has no specific greening measures 
and many red or fossil fuel driven ones, mostly involving new coal mines, including in environmentally sensitive areas. It doesn't plan on reaching zero emissions until 2070. Yet the subcontinent faces some of the greatest fossil fuel and heat dome mortality risks. And whether it's between or within countries, it's the wealthiest amongst us, regardless of where we live, that generates the most carbon dioxide. To keep the world within the 1.5 degree uh, range, each of us should produce no more than two tons of carbon dioxide a year. Now the richest 1% of us produce 70 tons. And Bill Gates, um, you know, the sometimes referred to as the world's global doctor, with his private jets and his 66,000 square foot house produces an estimated 7,500 tons. The Russian oligarch, uh, Robin Abramovich, uh, whose massive yacht and lifestyle produces 34,000 tons a year. But top prize may soon go to Amazon's Jeff Bezos, who's now building a half billion dollar biggest yacht in the world. And that's to go along with uh, one or two of his other super yachts. Uh, the new one may use sails instead of fossil fuel when it can, but its construction carbon footprint is almost unimaginable. And that's just a few examples of the interconnectedness of runaway wealth and climate change. And at the root of this lies the great capitalist contradiction that our economic growth imperative is also our consumption imperative. At present, we are consuming annually almost twice the ecological resources the earth can regenerate and provide. If everyone in the world consumed at the level of OECD countries such as Canada, we would need close to five planets to meet our consumption once. The big post COVID fear is that governments still hooked on the growth mantra still seem keen to stimulate increased demand or consumption to get that 1950s and 1960s style production consumption economy growing once again. And that by dropping the adjective sustainable in front of green growth, we can somehow continue to consume our way out of a crisis of overconsumption. Which brings my talk to the third great existential crisis, largely driven by the first two. Consider the air pollution data I presented. Consider the still deep and now worsening poverty. And then consider the future of water. Is it any wonder so many people are on the move? The quote from a now 22 year old book by my favorite sociologist, the late Zygmunt Bauman, the world increasingly is dividing into two classes. Tourists with the money and the status and the requisite visas to move through the world with no rooted obligation to place or place bound people and perhaps only temporarily grounded because of the pandemic. But then vagabonds, those less privileged hundreds of millions whose migration to escape conflict, poverty, drought, or simply to pursue the image of a better life in a wealthier country are increasingly unwelcome. Uh, no prize for guessing which class the people in this iconic photo belong to. And in the stark impressions evoked by a Somali poet now living in London, no one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well, and no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. Now we know that also there is an increasingly nationalist response to this move. Over 65 countries are building walls to keep out our vagabond migrants. Although this is nothing new if you consider the ancient Great Wall of China, tens of millions are housed in massive refugee camps, most of them located in low-income countries with scarce resources to provide for them, or they're held in prison-like detention centers awaiting processing in those high-income countries to which they've managed to set foot. And COVID 
has made this migratory push both more desperate and more difficult, with pandemic travel shutdowns adding more fuel to many countries already politically stoked xenophobic fires. The militarized closure of borders to refugees and would-be migrants has worsened since COVID and is predicted to get worse again. Okay, enough of all that doom and gloom. The somewhat rhetorical questions is that, will the pandemic create the momentum for the big shift away from this pathology of neoliberal globalization, which is a particularly aggressive form of capitalism that many of us thought had been thoroughly discredited by the 2008 financial crisis? And if it can shift, what are the new tools at our disposal to rally forward in our post-COVID quest to build back better, or as Sir Michael Marmot more equitably argues, to build back fairer? Now, the first thing we need to do is to finally and absolutely delegitimize the neoliberal doctrine that has been the dominant global economic ideology for the past 40 plus years, and that has brought us our present trinity of existential crises. The most concise definition of neoliberalism comes from its major proponent, the economist Friedrich von Hayek. Now concerned with the rise of communism in the immediate post-war era, adamantly opposed to socialism, worried about the post-war rise of the welfare state, and oversimplifying to, simplifying to some extent, uh, he and his neoliberal compatriots, such as Milton Friedman, argued that the economy is simply too complicated for governments to manage and that it was best to let markets regulate themselves through free trade, strong property rights, minimal state interference, allowing the rational choice of a world of sovereign individual producers and consumers. Now, Keynesian economists expressed these beliefs somewhat differently, that the nastiest of men for the nastiest of motives will somehow work for the benefit of all. Now, Keynesian economics with its emphasis on interventionist government oversight of the economy predominated in high-income countries during the 30 post-war golden years of economic growth, progressive taxation, strong unionization, new social protection programs, and sharp declines in income inequalities. This was also the era of rising consumerism and unsustainable levels of consumption the dawn of synthetic chemicals proliferating our world, plastics beginning to clog our oceans, and landfills progressively being shipped from richer countries to poorer ones, to say nothing of the start of the automobile era. So progressive in one sense and massively destructive in another. Now neoliberalism, since it's dawn in the 1970s and 1980s, neoliberalism has gone through three identifiable periods. The first, was in response to developing world debt crisis. Combined with the election of conservative governments in the US, the UK, and Germany, it gave neoliberals their opportunity to infiltrate public policy. As one example, the US Reagan administration led the way by slashing its marginal income tax rates from 70% to 28% and cutting corporate tax rates, creating a global rush to the tax cutting bottom. The World Bank and the IMF played their part in the form of structural adjustment programs. But the push to deregulate and to liberalize financial markets soon brought us neoliberalism phase two, the rise of what's been called funny money, arbitrage, the massively hedged speculation in derivatives. This eventually brought us to 2008 financial crisis, which after a brief bailout period by many of the wealthier governments, we entered neoliberalism's third phase, stage right, austerity. Now, austerity not only impoverishes, it also kills. A 2021 UK study estimated that austerity cuts to its public health services between 2010 and 2012 were associated with over 57,000 preventable deaths. So will the pandemic finally kill neoliberalism. I have some doubts about that. Uh, maybe yes, maybe no. Um, or will the recovery simply attempt to re-energize a business as usual with a fiscal hawks already clamoring for new rounds of austerity 
and all eyes once again on our overheated stock market and real estate, uh, which of course, exactly what occurred prior to 2008 and the financial crisis. Or will we experience a global economic reset? Not a reboot to what was, but a paradigmatic shift to what needs to be. A political economy in which the environmental and social protection needed to ensure health equity become our build back fairer goals. If we assume that whatever emerges from the pandemic will still be some form of market economy, even if no longer a neoliberal version, the only two ways in which the inequities built into markets have been corrected are when more value goes to labor than to capital, capital being investors, and when governments intervene with strong forms of regulation and redistribution. The easiest way to remember the first one, and I apologize for an old white American um, uh, uh, presenting this, but it's a great phrase, you know, kind of, I have to pay my workers enough to buy the cars they make for me. And this is what fueled the post-war period of rapid economic growth, rising wages, low inequality rates, and of course, the dawn of our mass consumer society. Since neoliberal economics became the dominant policy choice, we've seen a steep erosion in the share of economic wealth going to labor, enabled by declining unionization rates, government reductions in unemployment benefits, and deregulation of labor markets in the name of flexibilization. Now, these trends also point in the direction of policy alternatives, strengthened labor rights, increased minimum wages, and there's some progress on both of these fronts, uh, creating or strengthening transnational unions to organize across global supply chains uh, or provide universal basic income funded through general taxation and accompanied by publicly funded, subsidized and provided services. Now, the pandemic relief packages of high income countries provided us with a taste of what such a universal basic income as part of a social protection floor might look like. And as for the tax funding that such an initiative would require, it brings me to the second market taming tool that governments have. And I apologize uh, for the second of two white American men of a certain generation for supplying the best line. So the, the former Supreme Court justice that taxes are a price we pay for a civilized world, we might add to that for a healthy world and certainly for a health equitable world. So the former Supreme Court justice, his pithy observation is engraved in granite on the portico of the US IRS building. Uh, something that uh, the immediately former and wildly tax cutting US president presumably never read. Nor one assumes have the fiscal hawks and anti-tax advocates embodied in the annual Fraser Institute's Tax Freedom Day, which it likes to celebrate every year in Canada. Now the tagline is that on this day, you start working for yourself rather than for the government, chuckle, chuckle. But if we consider what a day without government might look like, we might be less inclined to celebrate that Tax Freedom Day. Now, as with declining labor shares of economic wealth, on the tax front, we've also been failing badly since the neoliberal era. And we've progressively seen a shift from corporate to individual taxation, a shift from taxation of high income earners to median and low income earners, an OECD wide trend that started in the 1980s and that only stopped briefly in the wake of the global financial crisis. And the average top rate worldwide now is barely 30%. And the Nordic countries and some of the EU member states are managing to retain some degree of progressivity in their tax rates, but they've not been immune from the neoliberal throttle. And the same applies to corporate tax rates. Most of this transnational profit benefits from huge declines in corporate taxation rates, tax competition between countries, creating enormous loopholes and windfalls, and the estimated nine to $36 trillion hiding out in tax haven nations. And that costs developing countries about $3 billion a day in lost tax revenues. 
Now, yes, the OECD and its member countries have been trying to plug some of these holes and have made some small gains. And we now have nearly all the world's countries agreeing to a minimum corporate global tax rate of 15% for the largest 100 transnational companies. Now, not enough by any means, perhaps a foot in the door, but only if the 1% don't block its enactment. I'm gonna take a little diversion now because it shows how the COVID response loops back to the issue of just taxation and the deep economic structures that give rise to our first existential crisis of income and wealth inequalities. Consider this headline title of an August 17th BMJ editorial. Early in the unfolding pandemic, all the world's leaders were busy virtue signaling that we're all in it together and no one is safe until everyone is safe. Billions of public money was poured into new vaccine research. But it didn't work out that way. Most of the world's high income countries entered into secretive advanced purchase agreements with the leading vaccine candidates. The result, most in the rich world are getting vaccinated while those in the poorer world are unlikely to have sufficient access until late 2022 and some estimate more likely mid 2023. And our already rich economies will begin to recover and much, uh, and much of the minimally vaccinated poor world, theirs will simply become poorer. But consider the profiteering allegation in light of the two leading vaccines. Between them, these countries received US $8.3 billion in direct vaccine research and development and clinical trial support. And before that, earlier research on the mRNA technologies they employ were almost entirely financed by public research dollars. Now, Pfizer made no new discoveries, but provided BioNTech with the manufacturing capacity. The advanced purchase agreements meant that there was no financial risk to Pfizer in doing so. Much the same applies to Moderna, although there the cost of research and development was almost 100% funded by the US government. Now both forms, both firms are, they oppose the TRIPS waiver and they defend their right to monopoly patents to determine when, where, how much and at what price their vaccines will be available. Both firms also argue that any tax increase will threaten future supply of vaccines. And if we take a look into 2022, um, their sales estimates are $90 billion. So we're, we're talking here about a massive shift of wealth from publicly funded research and advancement into private corporate shareholders. So let us be brave in the face of such self-serving sophistry and battle on for tax fairness. And there are heaps of tax policy options that governments could enact if they choose to listen to the routine opinion polling that consistently has their citizens asking for more taxes to provide more public services. We used to have wealth taxes. We used to have income taxes as high as 90% on income exceeding a certain astro astronomical level. And we used to have stronger inheritance taxes. We could bring those back if we collectively and through our governments are willing to stare down any protesting uber rich. And for the last three decades, we've had nominal government support to impose a small financial transaction tax to slow down speculative global investing of the type that gave us the 2008 crisis. By one reckoning, such a tax at 0.05% uh, or five cents on every $100 in currency exchange would yield over $8 trillion annually. And that's more than the total estimated amount required to finance all of the falling way behind sustainable development goals. So the time to impose such a tax is now. Our societies, our planet are screaming out for a worldwide overhaul of our tax policies. And they need to be dramatic increases if we are to rebalance the public books somewhat from the huge pandemic investments 
most high income countries governments have made into their people, their businesses, and their economies. Consider just, you know, in the, about the 20 year period from 2002 until now, the vast amount of global income, now we're not talking wealth, we're just talking income that goes untaxed. Um, and, uh, you know, we know who it is that that income is basically going to. It's not to the majority of the world's population. And we don't need to have so much untaxed income sort of just oozing itself around the planet. Now, there's a, another policy track governments could pursue alongside progressive taxation, which is to simply create new money for public good purposes. And this is following modern monetary theory, an idea that's gaining a lot of even quite traditional economic support. It's a fairly complex set of arguments for non-economists to wrap their heads around, but it boils down to two essential points. Governments do not need to worry about running out of money, ever, and governments do not need to balance their budgets. They can keep creating money, provided they also use taxation to keep inflation in check. And this theory holds considerable promise for the very heavy lifting that governments must now undertake to deal with our three existential crises. Uh, modern monetary theory got a big boost in the original Green New Deal proposed by the US Democrat, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, better known simply as AOC. And that deal foresaw a $6 trillion plus US budget increase to go into climate change, environmental protection, and a host of social protection and employment measures. The Biden administration was forced to pair this back to a 10 year $3.5 trillion green economic stimulus plan. And that's since been scaled back even further to maybe $1.5 trillion, about a third of which is for a green energy transition. But even as a shadow of its original intent, this could still be another foot in the door for more aggressive initiatives. The environmental and economic travesties of climate change are not going to disappear regardless of what uh, the Trumpian Republicans might think. So the need for strong government actions will persist. Now across the pond, the uh, 2019 EU Green Deal is similar in policy ideas to the American plan, but with a bit of a difference. It's $1 trillion plan comes with a legally binding obligation to no net greenhouse gas emissions by 2015. And that's been embraced at least rhetorically, if not legally, by most of the world's governments. The deal also set new targets for short-term emission reductions and includes a shift to a circular economy. And that's cradle to grave resource throughput control with minimal and ideally no waste, the right to repair. You know, why do we have to keep over-consuming as we were told to do? in the 1950s. Uh, like the US Green New Deal, it puts a lot of emphasis on winning the global competition for green technology manufacturing and economic growth. Again, trying to balance the economic objectives with job growth alongside environmental goals. And that's where we hit another big roadblock. Yes, electric vehicles are better environmentally than fossil fueled ones, but the finite nature of our ecosystem resources, as Bill Rees here kind of comments upon, should have us conclude that we need fewer vehicles, period, and especially fewer private cars. There have been suggestions that we should limit air travel democratically and equitably allocated rather than such travel being a consumer market choice. Stated somewhat differently, those of us in the overconsuming North must go on a mass consumption diet, creating some space for the underconsuming South. Remember that their consumption levels to no longer be poor have to go up a little bit more as ours drops. So, as Bill Reese, the Canadian environmental emeritus and the creator of the global footprint methodology, has somewhat lamented in an article, he says, Please prove me wrong. Simply decarbonizing economic growth 
or relying on yet to be discovered technological miracles will not solve the underlying contradiction of an economy based on ever increasing levels of consumption. Paraphrasing Martin Luther King, capitalism has served at least for some of us very well, but is no longer a system fit for purpose. If that purpose is to be planetary conditions fit for human life and socioeconomic conditions fit for health equity. Over 50 years ago, the Club of Rome published a seminal report titled The Limits to Growth, which showed how the growth trajectory of those 30 glorious post-war years was incompatible with environmental limits and social needs. Since then, economists, uh, environmentalists, ethicists, and yes, even some epidemiologists have taken aim at the inadequacy of capitalism's seemingly unstoppable growth mantra. In its most recent publication, the Club of Rome returns to its limitarian roots with three headline conclusions. We need to have a redistribution of material resources between rich and poor countries and rich and poor people within countries. Now that also means an income or wealth distribution as well as the material components that income and wealth might be able to provide or purchase. We need a very rapid transition to this more resource efficient economy from just not just a circular economy, but an economy that actually regenerates some of the materials that we continue to draw down on from the planet. And a shift to a shared services driven economy, sometimes referred to as well as a caring economy, an economy in which we provide social care or environmental care services, which have very low or no carbon intensity. And their detailed 2021 report identifies the key domains where economic policy and regulatory measures would have the greatest positive ecosystem and social equitable impacts, food, housing, and transport. It plots specific actions required across a range of countries, including Canada. And with our cold climate and our reliance on fossil fuel industries, thank the tar sands, we actually don't come out very well. The policy shifts now needed go far beyond a nice carbon tax chit chat between Justin Trudeau and Jason Kenney. Now the Club of Rome's data rich report is fundamentally clear that the necessary for life consumption diet that humans must embrace is particularly huge for exactly those of us who are now listening to this lecture. But such a diet in differing degrees is a global imperative. Yes, China, India, parts of Latin America and Africa never got the chance to exploit nature, expel its fossil fuel waste and grow rich and powerful as did today's wealthier countries and individuals. But this doesn't mean that they should do so now. We are all embedded in the same finite blue bubble that the environmental economist Barbara Ward once called our spaceship Earth. And so enter a new phrase in our economic lexicon, degrowth, or what some have called post-growth. The empirical, ethical, policy-specific, and social activists proclaimed degrowth ideas are slowly moving from the global policy margins to the global policy mainstream. Now, degrowth doesn't mean no growth. It does mean a planned and rapid decrease in our material throughput which means a decline in our ad incentivized mode of consumption, which means a transition out of the capitalism that has structured our societies and our lives for the past several centuries. Now, whether we succeed in such a transition is another matter. But to reprise our somewhat skeptical, prove me wrong ecologist, um, he's not unhelpful, even if his list of solutions will be a real challenge to deliver on. Nor is Marianne Mazzucato, an economist whose latest book, Mission Economy, A Moonshot Guide to Changing Capitalism, argues that government's pandemic responses are indicative of the potential for a more participatory approach to defining our priority missions around which governments gather the necessary players, private sector actors, civil society activists. 
Mazzucato, who also chairs the WHO's Council on the Economics of Health for All, sees governments as managing these missions, in part by actively shaping markets to achieve them, rather than being content in responding to market failures. And she too is optimistic about how a fulsome embrace of modern monetary theory can provide the fiscal fuel for such missions. And I am also hopeful about the new path that we might be taking. But I'm perhaps pathologically optimistic, uh, drawing some political inspiration from the present notebooks of the early 20th century Marxist and Antonio Gramsci. So whether we confront inequalities or oppressions of one form or another, and whether in the name of health equity or social justice, we're often drawn by force of analysis into a pessimistic view of the future. This optimism of the will an optimism embraced by action actually becomes a deliberate act of emancipatory resistance. And that resistance in turn is the foundation from which system transformations arise. And on that thought, I will close my talk and thank you very much. Oh, this is amazing. Yeah, so it's, uh, <laughs> what a mind expanding uh, experience that uh, actually bring together, I guess, the fundamentals of uh, uh, human uh, 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 existence uh, and the uh, behavior to uh, economics to the uh, the political realities that we face, you know, the global events that we're in uh, at uh, this time, and how health is actually interweaved in every aspect of these uh, discussions. And uh, uh, so, uh, it's, so it's kind of interesting, you know, from uh, your, you know, there are many kind of a philosophical aspects, you know, one can actually uh, delve into that is that, uh, you know, the individual, uh, you know, sort of, uh, uh, I guess, the priorities versus the societal good, right, you know, we can see that even from vaccination, you know, sort of uh, behaviors uh, to obviously, you know, thinking about uh, the larger picture in terms of uh, climate change and health. And uh, also in terms of the, um, I guess, you know, the interweaving of uh, the political uh, priorities, you know, versus uh, uh, societal needs versus, uh, you know, the individual, uh, I guess, choices, you know, and the, the, this is, of course, played most uh, prominently south of the border, you know, where the tension between the individual uh, rights and uh, the collection of individual wealth and the distrust of government, right? You know, a place into a very, very uh, uh, difficult conversation and or uh, tension. Uh, you know, at the same time, it has a huge uh, economic clout. Yeah. Uh, so this is uh, uh, so maybe we can open up for some uh, discussion and uh, you know certainly also keep in mind that uh, Professor Labonte has very kindly. Um, allocated the next hour, you know, with uh, some of our uh, uh, young investigators and trainees for discussion, but feel free to actually join us and you can email um, research services to get the link if you don't have one already. Yeah. So, um, uh, so uh, 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 maybe we'll open up for the uh, questions. So the first uh, question is from uh, Dr. Quan Chan. And uh, so is it possible to actually weighing us from the uh, consumerism that uh, we are so enamored with, right? You know, Black Friday is coming up and then there's a Christmas, right? You know, and we already warned that, uh, you know, get your, you know, shopping done now. And uh, similarly for the government and, uh, or for any organization, you know, everybody's all about uh, growth. You are, your job is evaluated, you know, based on the level of growth and uh, so, if that's the metric, uh, you know. So how do we, how do we ever wean ourselves from all these uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, things that we are taking for granted at the moment? Well, one of the ways in which we can at least begin this weaning off process um, is is to recognize uh, that we that as individuals we've basically been sold a bill of goods. You know, we've been sold we've been sold a lie. 
you go back to the the old environmental slogan of 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 uh, reduce reuse recycle and all of us basically you know globbed onto the recycle which was actually an industry initiative <laughs> so you know to avoid having the excess packaging the excess production the excess consumption um uh, there are things that we can do as individuals, um, but it's really going to require policy and regulation. And that's going to come about in a couple of different ways. One of them is that, is that as the one of my final slides showed, is that governments have to basically come forward and sort of say, we cannot consume as much. We have to reduce our material throughput, full stop. If we want to have a planet that supports human life in any way at all. We have to do that. So there's a, a bit of a pessimistic optimism I have, which is that that this is going to be unavo unavoidable. You know, the, the policy choices that have to be made are, are going to, they're, they're crowding in on us now. So it, it, it's almost like inevitable that at some point these, these decisions or these policies will have to be made. Um, uh, if we used taxation measures, if we used regulatory measures, we could actually fundamentally alter our consumption pattern. Um, uh, you know, I grew up in the 1950s, and 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 uh, and we 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 basically were were quite happy and quite healthy on a consumption diet that was about a third of what our present level of individual consumption is. So we don't need it, right? We can still have a a prosperous, healthy, happy, fulfilling life without retail therapy. Now that is going to have an implication. On employment, because the whole model is based upon you know people producing things that other people will then buy, mm -hmm. um, and if people stop buying and consuming, then there'll be less production of those things. But there, the policy alternatives that have been put forward, um, uh, well, first of all, the four-day work week, which has been tried out in a, in a number of different places, um, uh, uh, also the something called a job guarantee. And the job guarantee, and that takes us back to the, the modern monetary theory, um, is, that, is that when there is a, an unemployment or a shift in employment opportunities, because we are descaling our consumption levels, the government basically provides employment. It provides jobs. And these jobs basically go into areas that we know we need to do work on. We need more social care. We need uh, uh, more equitable forms of, 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 of providing services for, for most people, even in high income countries. The environment needs a huge amount of effort to basically begin to be restored and, and, and taken care of. So the job guarantee says that it's not gonna pay a lot of money, but it's gonna pay that, that people who are unemployed then become employed in doing these public good services. So there are, are ways of, of managing it. Um, but it's it's going to be disruptive. Yeah. No, I, so yeah. So maybe uh, kind of uh, uh, relate to that uh, is that uh, you know so these are obviously very large scale you know sort of uh, global things. Are there anything concrete that uh, us as individuals, uh, you know, we are kind of a health providers and uh, of course you know we play a role in society and things like that. You know, as individuals, are there things we can do? Uh, you know, that uh, can also, um, you know, sort of contribute to this overall agenda? I'd say, well, I'd say that there are two things. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the first is to, is to basically become much more aware mm -hmm. of what our own consumption patterns are um, and, and resist. <laughs> resist the temptation to go out to Black Friday and get, you know, the latest iPhone 122 version um, with slight tweaks, right? So, I mean, you know, kind of, you know, we, we, as I say, we, we, we've been sold uh, a set of, of, of very toxic pathological lies. Um, so resist those. Um, and the other, uh, though, is that, that individual actions are insufficient in themselves because we really need to transform social structures and institutions, not just individuals. Um, uh, and let's face it, uh, individual behaviors are shaped by norms, by laws, by institutions, by regulations. Um, so uh, there, I think that one of the things though uh, that we can do as individuals is find one of those civil society actor groups, find one of those particular trajectories or, or globalization, neoliberalism, transformation kind of, of pathways that we think governments really need to move on and try to encourage them, support them, either directly with our own time, our own writing, our own voice, 
um, or financially so that, that they are better able to continue to apply the kind of political democratic participatory pressures that historically through, so, through social movements have been the only means by which these, these fundamental transitions have been successful. Yeah, so thank you so much. Yeah, but uh, I think physicians themselves also, you know, do have role in society. And the, so, you know, the, uh, I think the propagation of these concepts are going to be important. Uh, I, you know, there are many questions. So maybe we'll just take one more because of the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, this uh, brings back on the health uh, issue in that, uh, you know, there is, uh, as a consequence, a lot of uh, health inequities, uh, you know, sort of really created through all these uh, factors you uh, mentioned. So are there ways in which we can do, you know, certainly, uh, you know, from, a, a, you know, sort of a health uh, provider and health system thinker uh, point of view of addressing some of these uh, inequities, you know, that's actually magnified certainly, you know, through COVID and uh, whether that's uh, within Canada itself or, you know, more globally from your kind of uh, thinking. Well, I mean, one of them is, uh, as I said already, kind of repeating a little bit, that, that, you know, be aware of our own consumption diets yeah. and how we can sort of pair those back. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 pay our taxes. Make sure we pay all of our taxes yeah. um, and actually advocate for paying more taxes. <laughs> oh, that's going to be a tough one. That's going to be a tough one. But yeah, let's get out there on the front lines and let's sort of, sort of say, yeah, yeah, we want, we want to pay more taxes. <laughs> um, uh, advocate for those kind of public programs that, that are so important from that kind of more social determinants of health approach. Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, like, yes, let's support increased minimum wages. Yes, um, uh, uh, let's increase public housing. Um, yes, let's put in place um, uh, really strong uh, uh, taxations on real estate transfers that will basically start to, to cool off this overheated real estate market, um, which is benefiting, you know, far fewer people um, uh, uh, than, uh, and, and shutting out larger tracts of the population from being able to have healthy or adequate housing. So th there are steps that can be taken, but it's, it's, it's first examining one's own life, um, examining the life or kind of speaking out amongst our social circles, which can be a bit embarrassing, but what the heck, I mean, we, we need to try. Uh, and then again, finding, finding those, those areas that we know from um, uh, either from my case, scholarly work or research work, or in a practitioner's place, their experience with their patients, um, uh, what, what those socially determining factors are that lead to health inequities. Um, you know, the obesogenic diets, the poor nutrition, the kind of uh, all of the fast food stuff that can, continues to proliferate, you know. So let's write prescriptions for healthy food. Let's write prescriptions for, for, for grain vegetables and sort of say, if I take this into the grocery, I'm gonna get some really healthy food at a lower price than all that ultra processed uh, obesogenic stuff. Yeah, and uh, you know, more cycling, walking, you know, sort of these things, you know, contribute mm -hmm. to a positive environment. Yeah, so uh, I, I, actually there are so many other great questions. Yeah, so just um, in view of the time, but feel free to join us uh, in the, um, uh, the next hour, the round table in which we can actually, you know, continue to delve into some of these uh, great uh, concepts and, you know, certainly thought provoking and, uh, but uh, uh, very, very important, obviously. And, uh, but uh, on behalf of the uh, entire community and, uh, you know, I think can be judged by the, uh, the, uh, the uh, questions that's uh, coming forward that, uh, you know, this is certainly extremely thought provoking, you know, sort of obviously uh, uh, really uh, have us uh, to think uh, on, uh, much uh, more global scale, you know, in terms of how health and the, certainly the pandemic, you know, has actually impacted uh, the world yet uh, all the interconnectedness, you know, that actually is beyond health itself, you know, in terms of economy, the political will, and, uh, you know, how society, uh, in fact, uh, prioritizes, you know, many of its uh, uh, actions. Yeah, so uh, really amazing, you know, mind expanding experience. This <laughs> is uh, fantastic. Uh, and uh, congratulations again on your award. You know, this is, uh, really recognize, you know, the amazing amount of uh, thoughtfulness, you know, in terms of your work. And uh, so we, uh, you know, want to, to uh, see that uh, the work uh, continue to, you know, have uh, its impact, uh, you know, sort of uh, amplified. And uh, hopefully, you know, today's lecture will also contribute to that as well. So thank you so much again, and really appreciate making time for us. Okay, thank you, Peter, and I'm looking forward to the discussion that will follow.
Great, thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Uh, great bye -bye. Uh, day, everyone. Uh, next uh, session uh, will be Sandra Black uh, in terms of the brain and a heart connection uh, in uh, the, uh, I think on December one. Thank you, and take good care. Thanks again, Ron. Um, again, as Peter, very thought provoking. Thanks again. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks, Rob. Yes.